so uh, thank you very much, uh, Dawn, for organizing this. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, turning up. Can everybody hear me? All right. Thank you. OK. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, what I think to be um, some interesting and rather underexplored issues in the philosophical significance of pride movement. I'm going to focus specifically on the case of disability pride, um, partly because this is from a book that I'm writing on disability, so that made sense to talk about that. Um, but also because I think disability pride is an area that uh, people find kind of surprising, that there is such a thing, um, and that uh, people are proud to be disabled, people have disability pride parades, so on and so forth. Um, and actually that surprising nature of disability pride is one of the things that I'm, I'm going to focus on. Um, so there's a, been a lot of discussion about the importance of pride movements uh, for their emotive importance. So, Pride movements as combat to shame, pride movements as building solidarity, pride movements as um, ways to help uh, collectively build self-esteem and build agency within a community. But what I'm going to focus on today and what I'm going to argue is that there is an important epistemic dimension uh, to pride movements, that pride movements actually uh, help us to know things that otherwise it's difficult for us to know. Um, and so in that, uh, to that extent, I think pride is as important epistemically as it is emotionally, um, and that part of its political importance is its epistemic importance. Um, so to argue that, I'm first going to focus on a concept that's introduced by Miranda Fricker in her groundbreaking book, Epistemic Injustice. So I think uh, the bit from Fricker's book that people are most familiar with is the phenomenon that she labels testimonial injustice. Uh, so testimonial injustice is when uh, people's testimony is discounted or not believed as much as it would in other circumstances be believed, not because of any um, sort of evidence that they're unreliable knowers or anything that makes them seem um, less likely to be uh, reliable sources of testimony, but because of who they are. Um, so because of identity prejudices about who people are, they're treated as less reliable sources of testimony. Um, so uh, paradigm cases, uh, eyewitness testimony um, from black Americans is not taken as seriously by juries as eyewitness testimony from white Americans. Um, and this is the kind of phenomenon that Fricker labels testimonial injustice. So, Nothing to do with what these people saw, nothing to do with what position they were in uh, when they were observing the phenomenon, or uh, nothing about beliefs about them, um, you know, not having reliable perceptual capacities or something like that. Everything about beliefs and identity prejudices about who they are, beliefs that certain kinds of people are just fundamentally less reliable. Often these beliefs are implicit rather than explicit. Um, but in the end of Fricker's book, the last two chapters, she identifies another phenomenon that she labels hermeneutical injustice, um, or hermeneutic injustice, she calls it both. So hermeneutic injustice are cases in which uh, aspects of a person's own experience or own self-conception are obscured because of dominant norms or schemas or stereotypes. So testimonial injustice is, uh, is two-way. You've got uh, two people who are in a conversation, and one person is devalued in their ability to know things because of this other person's prejudice about this kind of person not being the kind of person who's a reliable knower. Um, hermeneutical injustice doesn't have that same two-way element. So hermeneutical injustice is when a particular person finds it hard to know or articulate things about themselves and their own social experience, or even in some cases their own self-conception. And the reason they find it difficult to know and understand aspects of their own experience is particularly to do with stereotypes and prejudices about the kind of person that they are. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a few of the examples that Fricker gives to try to highlight what this phenomenon is, phenomenon that she labels hermeneutical injustice. 
Uh, so the first case that Fricker talked about in her book um, is the phenomenon of postpartum depression. Um, so postpartum depression is obviously something that now we're very familiar with. It's very easy for us to talk about. We can easily label and identify this phenomenon. But in the late 60s and early 70s, it was extraordinarily hard for women who had recently become mothers to understand their own experiences, um, to understand their own experiences of what was happening to them and how they were feeling, um, and to understand that what was happening to them wasn't obviously their own uh, isolated personal drama, that this was a systematic phenomenon that happens to women, um, and that is a common thing that happens to women. Um, and that is a combination of a very real set of biological factors that can happen after pregnancy, and then a very um, extreme psychosocial phenomenon of isolation um, that these women were experiencing after having uh, given birth. Um, but in a context that um, valorized motherhood so deeply, and you know that new motherhood was your completion as a woman, and this was supposed to be the most joyful and amazing experience that you'd ever had in your entire life, and then that pathologized women's emotions. Um, so any overwrought emotion, of course, is women's hysteria, and that's your own failing, that's your own fragility. Um, it became very, very difficult for women to understand what was happening to them as anything other than their failing as mothers um, and their failing as wives rather than a uh, real psychosocial phenomenon. So you can read all this stuff um, from early feminist movements, um, the, the consciousness raising seminars that uh, a lot of women went to at the time, um, where what they were actually trying to do when they were discussing these own experiences was just grope for an understanding of what was happening to them. And even just trying to articulate it and realizing that this is a shared experience, um, and that this was something that we could name and identify and wasn't just an individual women's experience of um, hysteria and of being a bad mother. Um, that was a very difficult thing for women to do. Um, and it was something that it took women a very long time to articulate uh, what was happening, what this phenomenon of postpartum depression was in a context where um, our understanding of motherhood and of women's psychology was not particularly influenced by women's own experiences. And it was very heavily influenced by men's understanding of what women are like. So uh, Fricker thinks that this is a case that's going to uh, be ripe for the creation of hermeneutical injustice, where the dominant norms, stereotypes, schemas, beliefs about what one group's experiences are like, in this case women, uh, are unduly and overly influenced by someone other than that group, so in, that, in this case, men. Um, so our understanding of what women's experiences were like in this case was overly influenced by men's beliefs about women, rather than women's beliefs about themselves and women's uh, dialogue and discussion about their own experiences, um, which then made it very, very difficult for women to understand and articulate their own experiences. So another case that um, Fricker discusses at length is the phenomenon of sexual harassment. Um, and she discusses the first uh, major court case where um, lawyers in the early 70s actually created the label sexual harassment um, to try to identify what was happening to women in the workplace. Again, this was a phenomenon where women realized that something was happening, um, but they just found it incredibly difficult to articulate um, what it was that was happening and why it was so upsetting. Because you go back and look at the interviews uh, from Carmita Wood, who was the woman who brought the first court case, and um, the vocabulary that she had to try to explain what was going on. Um, she knew that her boss's flirting made her uncomfortable um, and that she couldn't feel relaxed in the workplace. 
and that there was something about her boss's uh, romantic inclinations to her uh, that made her not want to go to her job and made her feel sick. Um, but the way that we would very easily describe what we look back now and see is just a severe case of quid pro quo sexual harassment. It was something that it was, it was incredibly difficult for her to articulate um, because the only way that she had to try to explain what was happening were these terms of um, flirting, romantic inclination, um, and the under, so the, the background assumption that she had that she was dealing with, of course, was that um, flirting in the workplace was kind of harmless. Um, and bosses flirt with their secretaries, and secretaries are sort of meant to be sexually available to their bosses, and that's just part of the norm. That's part of um, the standard, the expectation. So with that social background, she found it incredibly difficult to explain why it was that what was happening to her wasn't harmless, um, why it was that what was happening to her was so painful, and why she felt that she couldn't go to work, um, and she was having to take personal sick leave um, because she was feeling so stressed in her office environment. So again, this was a case where it was really difficult for her to articulate um, what was happening to her, and it ended up falling back on what she felt like were, were her own weaknesses. So she's like, I don't know why this flirting that for everyone else just must be harmless um, is making me so stressed out. Okay, it's, it's, probably, it's probably me. It's, I'm probably overreacting. Flirting in the workplace is harmless, but for some reason this is, um, this is just stressing me out. I just must be stressed about my job. Um, and it wasn't until um, people started bringing court cases for sexual harassment and even just created the label sexual harassment um, that people began to realize that this was a systematic phenomenon. Um, that this wasn't just an isolated thing that happened to isolated women. That this was a thing that was happening to women in the workplace as a general very common feature of their experience. Um, but again, at the time, this was a very hard thing for women to understand and a very hard thing for them to articulate. Uh, so that's another case that um, Fricker identifies as hermeneutical injustice. So hermeneutical injustice isn't just, isn't merely uh, a case where you can't properly understand or articulate your own experience. So, Fricker contrasts the kind of cases she's interested in to the kind of cases um, that might just be mere ignorance. So she talks about a person who has a strange or obscure disease that medical science doesn't yet understand. Uh, there's a real sense in which this person doesn't understand their own experience. They don't, there's epistemic gaps in their ability to understand or articulate what is happening to them. But this person is just kind of epistemically unlucky. Um, Nobody yet has the knowledge or the tools to explain to them. Science hasn't progressed far enough to explain to them what's going on. They don't understand um, what's happening in their body. So Fricker wants to contrast these kind of cases of epistemic unluckiness to the cases she's interested in, where the reason that you don't understand your own experience um, or you can't really understand or describe what's happening to you or even your own self-conception are because dominant ideas and norms of what it's like to be someone like you are not really informed by people like you and they're overly informed by um, other people, right? generally people in power. Um, so we're really salient case of this that I'm going to come back to and talk about a lot um, is the case of people who were uh, gay in the 1950s and 60s. So Fricker talks a lot about um, Edmund White's memoir, A Boy's Own Story. Um, and this is all about his coming to age as a gay um, adolescent young man in the late 50s and early 60s. And dealing with his emerging sexuality, which he really kind of was beginning to experience as a positive thing, as it contrasted to the only ways he really knew how to understand what it was to be gay, of course at the time what it was to be a homosexual, um, which were 
uh, deeply medicalized, deeply um, you know, rooted in the idea that being gay was a psychological deviation. So he had all these ideas of you know, the homosexual as uh, someone with a psychological disorder, someone who uh, was psychologically deviant, someone who was uh, you know, the, the, the villain in the period drama that's just sort of kind of uh, a little bit off, right? just not, not quite right, kind of um, a flaky person who needs help. Um, and he sought out uh, psychiatric care. Um, he went to all sorts of therapists. He went to his doctor. But he experienced this in deep tension with his emerging understanding of his own sexuality. And then there comes a point in the book where he says, looking back, I realized that what I wanted was to love men and be loved by them in return, but not to be a homosexual. And the idea was that uh, such was his difficulty grasping his own experience that that thought made sense. It made sense that it was like, right, well, I want, I'm a man and I want to love men and be loved back by men, but, but I don't want to be a homosexual. Because whatever it is to be a homosexual, that's something wrong, that's something deviant, that's something, that's the kind of person who needs help. I'm not a kind of person who needs help, but wait, if I'm a, if I'm a homosexual, I obviously do need help, but if I have these desires which I like, that means I'm homosexual. So he experienced this deep set tension um, which he eventually was able to move past, but it was extraordinarily difficult and damaging for him um, because he couldn't articulate um, the idea that it was okay for him um, and it wasn't deviant for him to actually like these desires that he had and to actually be okay with these desires that he had. Um, so again, this is a case that Fricker points to where um, this is someone who finds it difficult to understand and articulate his own experience. Um, and the reason that he finds it difficult to understand and articulate his own experience is because um, the norms about sexuality were overly influenced by heteronormative ideals of what sexuality should be like. They made it really hard for somebody to articulate the idea that it was fine to have these desires, and in fact, these desires were something that you really wanted to celebrate, um, and it didn't mean that you needed uh, some kind of psychiatric care. Um, so that's the phenomenon uh, that Fricker labels hermeneutical injustice. Hopefully I've said enough at this point to make uh, the basics of it clear. Um, so what I'm going to argue um, in what follows is that hermeneutical injustice is something uh, that disabled people are regularly subject to um, in the modern times. Uh, and then that pride is going to be an important part of combating this type of hermeneutical injustice. So, spoiler, that's where we're going. Um, okay. uh, so before I do that, I want to introduce a, kind of a rough and ready distinction that I'm going to try to put some work to now. When I say rough and ready, I take it we can understand uh, the paradigms of what I'm introducing for this distinction, I'm sure there will be all sorts of borderline cases. I'm sure the distinction is vague. I'm sure there are lots of other normatively interesting distinctions in the area. This is one, and it's one that I think is interesting and relevant. Um, so that's why I'm going to talk about it. Um, so I think we can draw a distinction uh, or draw a contrast between distinctions that we make that are purely descriptive and distinctions that are, in some sense, either implicitly or explicitly, uh, normative. Like the very way that we draw the distinction carries normative baggage. The distinction itself is normatively laden. So the kind of thing I'm talking about with a purely descriptive distinction is uh, people who are from Spain contrasted with people who are not from Spain. Or people who have blonde hair contrasted with people who do not have blonde hair. So that's sort of, okay, here's what you're observing the world. Um, here are some ways the world can be. You can be from Spain, or you can be not from Spain. Uh, you can have blonde hair. You can have hair that's some other color than blonde. Sort of describing ways that the world can be. Um, unless maybe there's some surpri surprising semantic content going on there. I take it that there's not a lot of normative baggage 
just built into that carving of those distinctions. You're just describing the way the world can be. Contrast that to what I'm going to take as a, a paradigm case of a distinction that you have to understand the normativity involved to even understand what the distinction is. Uh, the distinction between the saints and the sinners. Uh, so the distinction between the saints and the sinners uh, is not like the distinction uh, between people who come from Spain and people who don't. The distinction between the saints and the sinners, you have to have some normative concept already at work just to draw that distinction. Um, there's normativity built into the very nature of that distinction. It's not purely descriptive. Uh, now, I think you can draw prejudicial conclusions or you can make prejudicial dis um, judgments using either kind of distinction. So uh, I can first, but the idea is that um, for purely descriptive distinctions, you kind of have to do a little bit of a two-step. So first, I can draw the distinction people from Spain, people who are not from Spain. And then I lay some normativity over top of that. Right? Then I say, and people from Spain are lazy. Um, I draw the distinction between people who have blonde hair and people who don't have blonde hair. And then I say, and people with blonde hair are flighty, or they can't do math, or whatever people say about people with blonde hair. Um, I talk about people who are from New York, people who aren't from New York, and then I say people from New York are rude. Um, so contrast that to the way that we can make prejudicial judgments using normatively laden distinctions. So you can also make prejudicial um, judgments using normatively laden distinctions. I can say uh, the sinners are going to hell. Um, that's a prejudicial judgment, but it doesn't have quite as much of the same two-step. Uh, that I don't just draw a, a purely descriptive distinction and then add some normativity um, on top of it. Um, I'm just adding a further normative claim to a distinction that was already normative. So what I'm going to contend is that sometimes our distinctions and the prejudicial judgments that we make about social categories are more like the saints and the sinners judgments than they are like the people from New York versus people from or people not from New York. Um, so I take it that when we're considering the Edmund White case uh, for the idea of being gay uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, so the distinction between uh, the homosexual and the heterosexual. Uh, maybe on the face of it, it looks like a purely descriptive distinction. It's like, okay, um, there are people who engage in these kind of sex acts, and then there's people who engage in these kind of sex acts. That's the descriptive distinction, and then um, we add some normativity on top of that. But if you actually look at the way the distinction was used, uh, the way it functioned, uh, the way it was wheeled out to make characterizations, a homosexual wasn't just somebody who engaged in certain kind of sexual behaviors. Right? Um, by very definition, a homosexual was someone who had, uh, who was a sexual deviant, uh, who had a psychological disorder. Right? So there was normal sexual orientation. There were normal behaviors, and they didn't need to be statistically normal. There's all sorts of ways you could be statistically atypical, but still be straight. And then there were people who were queer. There were the homosexuals, the people who, uh, the very way of understanding what it was to be a homosexual um, was that you, your sexual desire was a deviation from the heterosexual norm. What it was to be queer was to have orientation that was queered from um, the heterosexual norm. So what I think about distinctions like that when you look at, when you look at um, how they function is that at least for some of our social judgments, they, they function more like the saints and sinners distinction than they do like uh, the people from New York, uh, people not from New York distinction. Uh, but as a result, I think for distinctions like that, it makes them particularly hard to give counterexamples to. It makes them particularly hard to um, 
show why the, distinct, uh, why the judgment that you're making uh, is wrong-headed or why the judgment that you're making is misguided um, or something like that. If you're making a judgment that's based on a normatively laden distinction rather than a judgment that's based on a purely descriptive distinction, that kind of judgment is particularly socially entrenched. Um, it's hard to get rid of in a significant way. Because think about um, the kind of judgments that we make, stereotypical judgments, uh, that we make based on purely descriptive distinctions. So um, you say people from Spain are lazy. I give you a long list of the great achievements done by people from Spain. Talk all about the, in fact, how long uh, hours people from Spain work. They just uh, break it up in various parts of the day. Um, you say people from New York are rude. And I tell you a little bit about cultural variation of norms for politeness. Um, and then um, give you a long list of you know, perfectly nice experiences with people from New York um, that fit a certain uh, cultural norm of politeness. You say people with blonde hair aren't very intelligent, and I give you a very long list of people with blonde hair that are perfectly intelligent. Um, that's not to say that that's going to get rid of the stereotype or get rid of the prejudice, but you can at least understand a counterexample if you've just got a purely descriptive distinction that you're making a prejudicial judgment based on. The problem with the way we understood the homosexual-heterosexual distinction in the 50s and 60s was that it was actually really hard to even understand what a counterexample would look like. So you say being a homosexual is to engage in sexually deviant behavior and experience sexually deviant uh, attraction. So the very understanding of what it is is uh, via this idea of deviation, of someone who is inherently psychologically troubled. How am I going to give you a counterexample to that? What I want to give you is an example of someone who is flourishing and thriving and having a wonderful life, but they're a happy, flourishing gay person. But the problem is, the person who thinks that homosexuality is deviance doesn't see that as a counterexample. They just see that as further evidence that, oh, look, that, that person's, that, that's, that's really deviant. That, that person is so deviant that they're really happy about the fact that they're deviant. Um, so it becomes very, very difficult to even provide counterexamples um, to this kind of prejudicial judgment because the normity and the normativity is actually just built into the way we understand the difference um, in this case between the homosexual and the heterosexual. So you want to say, okay, here's a case of a homosexual who's not deviant. Well, if I understand homosexual definitionally as someone who's a deviant, I don't even, I don't even know where to, I don't know how to process that counterexample that you're trying to give me. So I think one way, certainly not the only way, but one way that prejudicial judgments can become very entrenched is when our very way of understanding social categories and distinctions between social categories is normatively laden in this way. So one thing that I think is pretty clear Really hot down here. Is that going to work? So one thing I think is pretty clear when you think about it for not that long a time um, is that the way we understand the distinction between uh, the disabled and the non-disabled, uh, or between the disabled and the able-bodied, um, is a normatively laden. Um, our way of understanding the difference between, or at least our folk conception of the difference between the disabled and the non-disabled has a lot of uh, normativity built into it. And the word is suggestive of that, right? There's ability, and then there's disability. 
Um, but beyond that, I think you know our our basic fault conception, which disabled people have tried for many years to argue against, our basic fault conception um, of what disability is is, as an important sense, departure or negative departure from normal functioning, um, limitation in ability. I think a lot of times the way that people think about uh, what it is to be disabled is. Oh, well, you just you, you take the set of abilities that the, the normal person has, and then you just take a strict subset of that. That's what the disabled person has. Um, so disability is just like this is strict limitation. Um, disability is just like the normal abilities minus some. Um, and in a way, we think of disability as misfortune. Disability as uh, a sort of loss. So if you think maybe um, homosexuality was uh, deviant, I think the counterpart to that is that disability is tragedy. So uh, I think a lot of times we think about, especially if we're thinking about physical bodies and physical disability, you know, we think about you, your body is kind of like the outcome of a natural lottery. We don't anymore think about physical disability the way we used to, or like physical disability is um, a sign of divine malfeasance, or a sign of, uh, you know, if you have too many physical disabled people in your community, it's time to burn a witch. Um, we don't say, you know, rabbi who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Um, at least we don't say that kind of stuff out loud anymore. Uh, but we have a more naturalistic notion of um, disability as tragedy. So it's like, yeah, you know, you kind of you roll the dice when you get your body, right? You, the bodies are kind of an outcome of a natural lottery. And some people get really lucky. Some people have these live, athletic, beautiful bodies, and they all come from Scandinavia, and they're like really tall and they do sports and they're, you know, and they have very symmetrical faces and they're, you know, they just, I don't know, they got lucky. And then there's people who maybe got a little less lucky. They're kind of they're, they're short, or they have weird hair, or they you know, maybe are kind of really uncoordinated, or, um, you know, but, but they're okay. Um, I think we tend to think of disability as kind of the lower bound um, of what goes on in uh, the, the natural lottery. So disability, these are people who played the natural lottery and they lost. Um, they did not get lucky at all. Um, Disability is a kind of a natural misfortune. We no longer think of it as a divine misfortune. Um, but certainly, when people see you out on the street with a disability or you disclose a disability, their first and overwhelming reaction is, you're disabled? I'm so sorry. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, often immediately followed with, is there any hope for a cure? Um, is there any hope for a cure? Um, and uh, the, the other thing that you get a lot, um, which people invariably feel entitled to touch you, um, and it will put your the hand on your shoulder and say, um, you hang in there. Hang in there. Thank you, stranger. Um, I will do that. You hang in there, too. Um, so there's this idea that um, disability is a sort of, uh, you know, Natural bad luck. If homosexuality in the 50s was deviance, disability is misfortune or tragedy. We've come a little ways beyond Tiny Tim, but maybe not as far as we might like to think. Um, and one way in which this is absolutely manifest um, is the way in which we expect successful disabled people to disavow disability, to disavow disability um, as something they think about or to disavow any sort of disabled identity. So if you ever watch interviews with Paralympians um, after they've done something successful, if you ever watch interviews with somebody who's on uh, whatever sort of news show or CNN or something being profiled because they're riding their wheelchair across the country or they're climbing a mountain or something, 98% of the time you will hear the phrase, well, I've never really considered myself now, the social meaning of that phrase comes apart from the literal, literal content of what it 
what they do not mean when they say, I've never really considered myself disabled, is that they don't consider themselves to have a physical condition which marks them out, given current social norms, as having a disability. They will still park in the disability-specific parking spaces. They will use the disability-specific uh, bathroom stalls. They will enter the disability-specific sporting events, all of which would be really weird things to do if you didn't actually think of yourself as disabled in some sense. What they mean when they say, I've never really thought of myself as disabled, is something to the effect of, I've never thought of myself as, I've refused to see myself as limited or less than or lacking in some important sense. So disability is tragedy, it's limitation, it's misfortune. And I don't think of myself like that. Um, so I've never really thought of myself as disabled. And it's a very striking thing that we expect that from our most successful disabled people. Because I mean, imagine, imagine the counterpart of that if you're looking at you know, really successful and barrier-breaking people from other social groups. So imagine if somebody had said to Madeleine Albright, um, you know, asked her for her thoughts about becoming the first female Secretary of State, and she said, well, you know, I've never really considered myself a woman. Um, I've just been determined to overcome my gender. And she didn't say anything about that in terms of claiming a particular um, non-binary gender identity or something like that. She just said, you know, I've never really considered myself a woman. I've just been determined to overcome my gender identity. Or if, when asked the same question, Colin Powell had said, about race, well, I've never really considered myself black. I've just been determined to overcome my race. Um, we allow other people to celebrate being barrier breakers uh, for their membership in social groups. For disabled people, we expect them to say, well, I've never really thought of myself as disabled. Interestingly, if you look back historically, we actually did used to expect the very same kind of thing from very successful or barrier breaking women. Um, so if you look back in, particularly in the, the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance, you get examples of um, strong female leaders specifically disavowing their femininity, um, specifically disavowing uh, their womanhood because womanhood was less than. So the most famous of these, although there's quite a lot of them, um, is the uh, speech that's attributed to Queen Elizabeth I when she's uh, rallying the troops, and she says, I may have the body of a weak and frail woman, but if I choose, I have the heart and stomach of a king. Um, so she was very specifically disavowing femininity, because she was, she was going to overcome it. She was going to have the heart and stomach of a king, um, even if she had been put in this, uh, in this weak and frail body of a woman. Um, but certainly we expect of successful disabled people that they disavow uh, disability. And on the flip side of that, uh, when someone says to you, you know, I've never really considered you disabled, that is a compliment. Um, that is an incredibly well-meaning compliment um, that people say to disabled people. Um, I take it what it means is, again, not I've never considered you to have a particular physical feature that marks you out as disabled. What it means is I've never thought of you as a sad sack. Um, I've never thought of you as, uh, you know, particularly sad or depressing or limited. Um, good for you, <laughs> because there's a, otherwise there's, it would be such an odd thing to say, um, you know, especially to an out and uh, visibly disabled person. I've never really considered you disabled. That's strange. Um, that's a strange. That's a strange fact about you. Um, but it's something that, that people say to disabled people all the time. Um, and it is intended very much as a compliment. And I take it that what it means is, I've always thought you're just as capable as the rest of us. Um, I really thought of you as closer to normal people um, than, than maybe other disabled people. Um, so I think that uh, there's a pretty strong case that the way we understand disability is normatively based. Um, 
has a lot of normative baggage with it. So our understanding of disability um, carries with it uh, notions of uh, loss, misfortune, being lacking, being less than, uh, so on and so forth. This is why these disavowals of disability make sense. So, in that context, it can become very hard for people to understand and art for disabled people to understand and articulate their own experience. Um, to understand and articulate their own experience of well-being. Because um, certainly disabled people experience a relatively high uh, amount of well-being, at least perceived, perceived well-being. Um, and a lot of disabled people, especially disabled people um, who are socially integrated, so this is closely correlated with disabled people who are managed to be uh, socially integrated, and even more closely correlated with disabled people who have uh, been able to establish some sort of disability community. Uh, so they feel uh, community or a sense of community with other disabled people, and particularly those who have gotten involved in the disability rights movement. Um, they don't feel that they are thriving in spite of their disability. They don't feel that they are working every day to overcome uh, their disability. Um, they feel that they have bodies that are um, interestingly different um, than the status quo or the perceived norm, um, but that they these are interesting and good ways for bodies to be, these are good bodies to live in, and that they value their experience of disability. Um, but this is a very, very, very hard thing to articulate or make sense of um, in the context of disavowals of disability. Um, so I'm going to read a quote from uh, the filmmaker Bonnie Cher Klein, who was a famous feminist filmmaker who became disabled after a stroke uh, when she was in her late 40s. And she talks about uh, her first experience going to a disability rights event. And she says, a gutsy, nervous young woman with a thick drawl of cerebral palsy is MC. Not only is her speech different, but a new language is being spoken here. I feel like a privileged eavesdropper at first, but she is speaking for me or about me. Or is me? Or, or, or is she? She cues us for a chant. Disabled and the crowd responds. Proud. My throat jams on the word mid-chant. Is this honest? Who am I trying to fool? It's one thing to accept, but another thing to be proud. I'm proud of surviving and adapting, maybe. But am I proud of being disabled? But it feels good to be shouting with hundreds of other bodies who look happy despite, or is it because of, their deformities? Or is the word differences? So Cher Klein describes that initial experience, and she talks further about how difficult it was for her to not feel like disability pride was some kind of oxymoron. Um, that celebrating disability rather than just fighting for rights and for access didn't make any sense. Because Here's this thing, it was this tragedy, it was this loss, this thing that she was supposed to feel bad about. And then she went to a rally where people were saying, this is something that we're celebrating. And it was so psychologically jarring um, that she literally wasn't sure it made sense. It felt like an oxymoron. So it actually kind of starts to sound like, uh, there's this uh, fantastic animated film called Wreck-It Ralph uh, that's about computer games. And they have a villain support group. And the mantra of the villain support group is, I'm bad, and that's good. I'll never be good, and that's not bad. Um, and I think, you know, if you have, if you, if you go into this context with the very sort of normatively laden uh, notion of disability, and then people start talking about disability pride, you're thinking, that's, I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense. Um, what on earth is there to be proud about? I mean, unless you're just being willfully obtuse. Um, but this is exactly the point at which I think the epistemic role of pride 
uh, is incredibly important. And when we think about pride movements, um, it's as important to focus on their epistemic import as it is on their emotive or their sort of social solidarity import. Um, because when you think about what happens, especially in the gay pride movement in uh, the 60s and 70s, how did we begin to change the idea uh, that homosexual was just, by definition, a deviant? Um, homosexuality was just a deviation or sickness. Um, well, it seemed that the goal of the pride movement was to say, all right, we cannot just, um, through some version of respectability politics, try to provide counterexamples to the standard way of thinking about this distinction. This distinction has got to be turned on its head. It's got to be overthrown. Uh, so the message of the gay pride movement was, OK, this thing that you are telling us is shameful and is deviation and that we need to seek psychological help for um, and that you only talk about with your doctor and maybe your priest. We're having parties about that in the street. Right? Um, we are throwing carnivals, and does it not just look like tons of fun? Um, don't you want to come and join this party because it looks a lot more fun than the party that you're having? Um, and the idea, uh, and what seems to have happened collectively with Pride, was that it gave both gay people and straight people a different way of thinking about what was going on. It gave people access the idea, and certainly when Edmund White talked about it, it gave him access to a way of understanding his sexuality that just wasn't available to him before. Um, rather than thinking about, okay, well, homosexuality is deviation, so these things that I'm experiencing that I'm fine with must be deviation, and I don't know how to reconcile that. Um, it gave him a different way of understanding his experience, was, was to say, this thing that people are telling you is bad and wrong and deviation, this is good. This is something that you can celebrate. This is something that you shouldn't want to go away. This is something you can have a party about. Um, so it was a sort of collective movement building that allowed people to understand their own experiences in a way that was previously actually very difficult for them to articulate. Um, very difficult for them to explain even to themselves what was going on. And the way in which it, combated, it, it helps combat hermeneutical injustice is that it's the people who are the underrepresented, the minority, who are beginning to be able to influence the common ground, the stereotypes, the norms about how we understand this distinction. Right? So the reason that hermeneutical injustice arises is that, you know, how we understand the difference between homosexual and heterosexual is determined by heterosexual. The pride movements are giving these people a way of influencing that common ground, saying, no, you need to ask us, and here's how we feel about it. So I think that there's an important sense in which pride is a way of combating prejudicial judgments based on normative relations. Pride says, don't try to counterexample the distinction on a case-by-case -case basis. Show why the distinction is, is, is wrong-headed. Show why we need a new way of thinking about this distinction. This way of uh, thinking about the distinction that we have is wrong-headed. And I think that that is very much what's needed in the case of disability because um, one thing that you see that's very striking about when disabled people try to describe their own experiences and their own positive experiences um, is that it's difficult for them to be heard. So just like when in the 50s and 60s gay people tried to describe being happy about their sexuality, being thriving uh, people who experienced uh, gay sexuality, they were just interpreted as even more deviant because well, good grief, if you're happy about it, um, if you're not even getting help. And that, cert that same kind of discounting and disbelieving we see in contemporary culture for people with disabilities. Uh, so one really uh, 
famous case is um, the disability rights activist and lawyer Harriet McBride Johnson. So she wrote this amazing article uh, for the New York Times Magazine called Unspeakable Conversations, a lot of which is about her interactions with the philosopher Peter Singer um, and trying to have dialogues with him about disability and finding the whole thing incredibly uncomfortable. But one of the things that she says in the article is how she and her colleagues in the disability rights movement and many people like her find their experiences of disability incredibly rewarding. There are things they value, but she's grown weary of trying to explain this to non-disabled people because they don't listen um, and because they think they already know everything that there is to know. So really, what's the point? So she says this very eloquently in this article in the New York Times. Um, and a few years after this article was published, uh, she died. And the New York Times published an obituary for her, which they titled, Happy Nonetheless. Yeah. Um, so she was right. <laughs> um, even though she had explained incredibly eloquently and articulately about her experiences and about how she's not, she very specifically says, I'm not happy in spite of. Um, I'm just happy with my life, and I'm satisfied with my life. And yet, she was interpreted as saying, nonetheless. I have overcome. So the stereotype of the tragic overcomer, the brave little soldier who's going to keep going, um, is very, very difficult to uproot. It's so deeply entrenched that it's hard for disabled people to just give individual counterexamples. So this is the point at which I think the epistemic import of pride is incredibly important. Um, so I'm going to read another quote from Cher Klein, where she says, in retrospect, the clicks in my consciousness about disability parallel my coming to feminist consciousness two decades earlier. For a long time, I denied I was disabled and kept my distance from other cripples in the hospital gym because I was an exception to the rule. Later, I was sure I could overcome it. I would be super crip. I thought I would support the rights of other people with disabilities, but I was not oppressed. As time passed, I experienced with great pain the ways in which other people's attitudes and societal barriers disempowered me. At first, I eternalized the oppression and lost all self-esteem. Then, as I discovered my commonality with other disabled people, I began to see more clearly. And with solidarity came strength. And then here is uh, the definition and characterization of disability pride from the largest disability pride uh, parade in the country, which is in Chicago. Disability is a natural and beautiful part of human diversity in which people living with disabilities can take pride. That's a personal and radical concept. Persons with disabilities must live and breathe it in order to communicate it to one another and to society. The sad sack, the brave overcomer, the incapable are worn out stereotypes and the parade refutes them by giving us a time and a space to celebrate ourselves as we are. We are part of the richness and diversity of this country and this world. We are, by marching in this parade, giving the world a chance to express pride in us, too. We will not hide behind doors. We are out in the streets. So I think that pride movements often in contemporary um, debate have a bit of a bad rap because they're associated with identity politics and um, sort of controversial things that people associate with movement building in the 90s. But I think in the case of um, gay pride in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and disability pride now, it's a place where identity politics is not as problematic as you might think, um, precisely because it's a case where the epistemic importance of this is actually being able to specify that there is an identity here. Um, that saying, I am disabled, is a social identity, um, and that it's something that you can say and that you could, you don't have to disavow. You don't have to say, well, I've never really thought of myself as disabled. Um, that you can be a successful disabled person and that's something that you can take pride in. Um, and that's something that can be socially important to you. Um, so that, I think, is the epistemic import of pride movements. It affects what people can know um, in addition to how they feel. Great. Okay. So I think it is perfectly consistent um, for a defender of um, the view that 
uh, disabilities are on the whole, um, by themselves, neither good nor bad. They're just kind of neutral features. Even if they can certainly be bad for some people and certainly be bad in some contexts. Um, to say that there are aspects of being disabled um, that are bad or harmful. Um, on the flip side, there are aspects of um, being disabled that are good and enriching. Um, and I think one thing that's telling is that when people who are not disabled think about what it's like to live as a disabled person, they tend to just focus on um, the what they think of as the bad thing. Right? Um, and they don't so much think about uh, what you might think of as uh, the good thing. So I'll draw an, an, an analogy, and then I'll come back to the case of disability. Um, I think that there are plenty of things that are bad, uh, in some sense of bad, harmful, negative. I would prefer they weren't around about being biologically female. Um, there just are. We could talk more about it, but you can imagine um, the kind of things I'm talking about. Um, on the flip side, there are some things that are good about being biologically female. Um, historically, uh, the female body was pathologized. Uh, people focused on the bad things um, about the female body. Um, in fact, they thought that the female body was just literally a deformed male body. Um, but um, people have emphasized that, um, you know, look, there's, there's some good things, there's some bad things. Uh, maybe in some context it's really bad. And in fact, you could want to get rid of some of the things, right? I am, you know, I, th I take it that when Mary Wollstonecraft wrote Vindication of the Rights of Woman, she was uh, arguing both that it's not bad to, or in inherently bad to be a woman and to be biologically female. That doesn't mean we don't think it's an improvement that, uh, you know, mortality rates have greatly been reduced in childbirth and that you know, women now have a much greater degree of reproductive autonomy, and um, you can buy tampons at the drugstore on the corner. Um, all of these things make it much easier to inhabit a female body. Um, it, not wanting to deal with the kind of things that people who inhabited female bodies in the 1800s dealt with didn't mean that you wanted to be male. Um, it just meant that there was some stuff that um, you um, weren't that nuts about. So in the case of um, disability, I think a lot of times people who are non-disabled uh, focus on what they take to be the really bad things. And again, they think of disability as just, okay, you take a normal person's abilities and you just subtract from that. So in the case of, uh, say, deafness, people think, well, look, listening to music is really good. It would be sad if I couldn't listen to music. So um, it would be worse, to do. There's, there's some sense in which being deaf is bad. Um, a good friend of mine who's deaf talks about a lot about how much pleasure she gets from experiencing music via vibration. Um, that's something that uh, hearing people can't do um, because the sound sensation pretty much overwhelms it. Um, and she talks about how pleasant it is to walk around really big cities um, and not hear anything. Right? Just feel like you're in this world of chaos and you just kind of are floating through it. And everybody else just seems to be really, really stressed about stuff that you're just kind of like, um, it, it just doesn't affect you. So, you know, I think it's perfectly consistent to say, are there some bad things about it? Yeah, sure. Um, are there some good things about it? Sure, yeah. Um, is it on the whole bad for you or good for you? That probably depends on what you want, what your projects are, what social context you're in. Um, I think it's sort of overly simplistic to just say, okay, it's bad. Um, I, think, I think that's sort of simplifying um, the physical situation that a lot of disabled people find themselves in. Um, especially because a lot of the bad effects that disabled people face are um, socially mediated. Um, they're because of lack of access. So I think, you know, there's a lot of evidence that it is, in a very important sense, harmful to be gay. If you look at the suicide rates of gay teens, 
But we don't respond to that by saying, right, we should find a way, if at all possible, to eliminate being gay. Right? We think, OK, we need to stop being so um, heterosexist. That's terrible. Um, but for some reason, we tend to look at disability and say, right, the solution to this problem is to get rid of the disabled people. Or not the disabled people, the disability. Um, depends on who you ask. Some people want to get rid of the disabled people. Um, right, OK. Um, so I think in terms of uh, w the way I would think of uh, the way I would think of uh, disability pride, and I think how it's often defined in the disability pride movement, is just the idea that disability is a um, part of human diversity that is uh, worth that, that is something that we should celebrate. Um, that is not obviously something to um, be pitied or eliminated or cured. Um, now that doesn't mean that we. I, th I, th I think it's, th there's a lot of really complicated issues around there. Like, I don't think, for example, it's bad for scientists to look for um, what you might think of as cures for disabilities. I don't think that it's wrong for you know, uh, people to take those when they have them, so on and so forth. Um, and um, I think that um, the, the core tenet of um, pride movements in general has been um, there's nothing sort of there's nothing bad or wrong about this thing that we're celebrating. It's not something uh, that needs to be pathologized. Um, it's something that is worth celebrating, um, and it's something that yeah people can take pride in. I think it's not something um, so giving it much more of a precise definition than that I think is going to be difficult because it is more about a social movement then. Um, so in response to your second question, I, mean, I think that's a, that's a fantastic question. And I would have um, two separate things to say about it. Because um, I think there's this way of uh, thinking about um, accessibility and accommodation that's very common, um, which I think is Ultimately, ultimately misguided and ultimately um, masks a lot of the social elements of disability, which is that uh, he thinks about accommodation as things that we give to individuals to make up for um, certain kinds of um, in, in misfortune, certain kinds of inherent inequalities. So it's like, okay, that's that's a shame for you. You know, you have you, you've undergone this misfortune, so we will give you these accommodations to make up for this personal fact about you, um, which is your disability. But I think that oftentimes, what's actually happening with accommodation is that we accommodation should be understood as a more social feature. What we're doing when we're offering accommodation is making up for the fact that spaces weren't designed for disabled people to begin with. Uh, spaces and technology and all the kind of stuff that were like, weren't designed th thinking about disabled people. We kind of designed a lot of this stuff um, not actually taking into account uh, the idea that disabled people deserve to be out and about and, and in society. So in a lot of cases of accommodation, not all of them, um, but in a lot of cases of accommodation, I think we should think about it not as giving to individuals to make up for an individual misfortune, but instead making up for a social injustice, right? making up for the fact that we designed spaces um, and we designed technology without actually considering disabled people. Um, and of course, now, when we go into boardrooms and universities and things, as women, we don't have to have special accommodation, but we did. Um, for you know, there was a long time when you went to um, you know fancy uh, elite universities or places like that where there would there would not be any there would only be a men's restroom. Um, there wouldn't be any. Um, it would be single sex accommodation, and it would all be for men. There's all sorts of um, kind of terrifying stories about when they first tried to let women into various of the uh, Oxford and Cambridge colleges. Um, 
about like how big of a deal this was for accommodation. It was like, where are we gonna where are we gonna put the women? We don't we don't have facilities for women. Um, I mean, you might also think that um, there are issues of accommodation and um, accessibility for gay couples who want to have children, um, and we don't see these the same way that we see uh, accommodation for disabled people. But that's in part because we, you know, we now have this idea that okay, so being being gay that's a perfectly socially acceptable thing. Um, Here's this thing about gay couples, they can't have their biological children, so, you know, let's, hooray, let's help them out in other ways. Let's explore other avenues. Um, so we don't see it as much as a sort of a, a, a personal deficit. Um, that being said, I, I'm also skeptical about the idea of universal design. Um, I think it's maybe a, a very pretty dream, but um, I'm not sure that it is, uh, Feasible. I think different disabilities have different accessibility needs, which sometimes conflict. I think we need to be realistic about this. Um, but I'm also very sympathetic to the um, feminist criticisms that says what this should make us question is not the badness of disability based on the fact that um, disabled people um, are, you know, are going to have uh, various demands on society, but rather this idea that somehow the goal is for us to all be autonomous little person parcels that never make demands on anyone. Because realistically, we all have demands on society, right? We, we, you know, um, and through various points of our lives, our, um, you know, have more requirements on social structures and social institutions than at other parts of our lives. So, yeah. Yeah, so I, I absolutely agree with, uh, with a lot of what you said there. And I didn't, by any means, uh, want to suggest that, like, uh, Pride is where you're going to stop, uh, or pride is is where it uh, is is what's going to be sort of a, a panacea to any of these problems. But I think one big thing that a lot of disabled people face is just understanding social phenomena as social, um, because it's so easy to understand the bad aspects of your experience as just individual, um, which is of course the same thing that happens to a lot of. Uh, Women um, in the you know in the workplace in the 60s and 70s, and certainly what happened uh, to to a lot of gay people. It was really difficult to understand social aspects of your experience as social, um, rather than as just individual failing um, or individual misfortune. Um, so the way that I'm thinking about it is that pride is and pride movements are kind of an important starting point because they're um, something that allows um, allows a kind of movement building, it allows people to say, um, "Hey, you're you're thinking you're thinking about this wrong. Um, you're thinking about this in a way that's confused." And it allows them. I mean, a big thing for me is just allowing disabled people to artic articulate their own experiences, um, because that's a very very hard thing. And I take it that that's kind of a precondition to doing a lot of this other social work. Um, because to realize that a lot of the social work has to be done, um, you first have to um, be able to uh, be able to, to articulate that you know, disability is a social identity and disability is something that, you know, that, that, that we can be proud of. So then, uh, to then be able to say, hey, um, other people aren't viewing this correctly. Um, and I think one thing that's interesting is that there's, there's a lot of empirical work that says, you know, this isn't just a sort of a purely academic issue of how are we thinking about this. Like, there's a lot of empirical work that suggests that the way that disabled people think about themselves and think about their disability is very strongly correlated uh, and a very good predictor of their well-being and their sense of life satisfaction um, and their self-esteem. Um, so sense of disability um, self-acceptance and a positive attitude towards disability are two of the best predictors of um, well-being for disabled people. But what seems uh, one thing that seems to be the case is that it's really hard for disabled people to develop that in isolation. Um, so what seems to be the best way for disabled people to develop that is by integration with a, dis a disability community. 
yeah, I think all that social work is really, really necessary, but I was thinking of the price. Price is like a starting point. Um, right, right. Okay, so that, that's an excellent question. And um, this is uh, where I run into uh, part of the difficulties of giving one chapter <laughs> of, a, of a book. Um, but yeah, so I absolutely agree that um, things like disability are political categories. Um, but I also think, um, so I, one of my frustrations with um, sort of standard social constructionist approaches to um, political categories, especially as they're applied to um, disability, is that there's, a, there's this sense in which there's an admirable thing that the social constructionist wants to do, which is say, uh, you're paying too much attention to, uh, to the biological or to the natural and everything, and that's obscuring the social reality of what these things are and the political reality of what these things are. Um, but there's a sense in which sometimes that can kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, because at least for some of these um, categories, they are embodied. Right? Um, they are embodied things. And um, what your body is like can, can matter to them. Um, so I want to say right off the top of the bat, I don't want to commit to the idea that there is a single category of disability that covers uh, cognitive disability, physical disability, um, all types of neurodiversity. Um, it might be that there is a single such category. It might be, in fact, that that tripartite distinction that we think about is just completely wrong-headed. Um, it might be that instead these kinds are maybe unified by analogy, um, the way I think that uh, Broccoli is healthy, uh, running is healthy, um, and my marriage is healthy. But they're not all healthy in the same way. There's no one property of healthy that they all share. Um, so they might instead have, have some sort of other uh, commonality. So one thing that I've wanted to do is focus, like start small, to focus on disability, uh, physical disability, see if I can build up some interesting things to say about that. Hope that other philosophers will come alongside me and. Uh, you know, say some interesting things about other categories of disability. I know Kevin Simper right now is writing some really interesting things about cognitive disability. Um, and Eva Kate, of course, has right, written wonderful things about um, uh, cognitive and psychosocial disability. And, um, you know, I think disability needs to be a big intent. So I've been uh, primarily focused on, um, on physical disability. But I think that uh, Charles Mills has this theory of uh, rape. Um, where he wants to be a social constructionist about race, but he also thinks it makes sense in the current, because of the current political context, um, to say, yeah, but yeah, but what are you really, <laughs> right? Apart from um, how you think about yourself or how you self-describe, the way maybe uh, Dubois' political theory of race would think about you, or somebody like Chica Jeffers' uh, theory of race as, as cultural identity or something like that, he, he thinks it makes sense to say. But, 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 but what are you really, right? Um, what's, what's the underlying uh, metaphysics of race? And he thinks that that underlying metaphysics is socially constructed. The reason why that property is salient is for political reasons. But whether or not you have that property uh, can be independent of how you self-identify. Um, and I guess I think the same thing about disability. So I think the reason why disability is a socially interesting category is because of the disability rights. Um, because it's a category that people have found useful to organize themselves under in um, organizing a, a civil rights struggle. Um, but then I think um, whether or not you are disabled isn't merely a matter of self-identifying, because you can have the kind of physical condition that the disability rights movement is trying to promote justice for, whether or not you self-identify as having that kind of condition. Um, so I think disability is definitely a political category, but that might extend beyond how people um, self-identify. Um, that was a lot that I think. Um, um, whether or not that's going to create hermeneutical injustice, um, I think not all aspects of people, um, people feeling tension in how their experiences are described. Um, are going to be the kind of things that Fricker is going to want to categorize as hermeneutical injustice. Um, so if you take cases of intentional racial passing from the late 
people who um, could pass as white and were on purpose passing as white, um, and particularly like, they did not want to self-identify as any sort of like as black or non-white or anything like that because they felt they had some prejudicial ideas about being black and they didn't want that to describe to them and they wanted the political reality of being white. I think it's not hermeneutical injustice to describe a category of um, black pride or solidarity or something along those lines that would include um, the race reality of those people. Um, so I think just because somebody might not self-describe in a certain way or experience a social category in a particular way doesn't obviously create hermeneutical injustice of the, the way for thinking. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It certainly should in the sense of if, if it's any sort of, like, it would, uh, that they're blameworthy for not thinking about themselves like that, or um, there might be a practical should where there does seem to be evidence that people who have a positive attitude towards their disability are just happier um, um, and tend to be more successful and do better. So if there's if there's a sort of pragmatic ought, um, then I might be happy with that kind of normativity. But in terms of any kind of blameworthiness or sort of you're making an epistemic error or something like that, um, then absolutely not. Um, and I think that's because, um, so take the case of the, say, the person, the gay person in the 1950s who went to a therapist or something like that to try to. Um, I think like, that person was absolutely responding to the evidence that they had available to them at the time. So it's like you can't fault someone, I, I think, epistemically for um, responding, you know, re responding to the dominant norms and stereotypes that they have available to them at the time, even if maybe they would have been happier if they if they had thought about things differently or something. But um, you, you can't say that that they were doing something. I think I think it's really important in situations like this that we don't place um, we don't say it's like okay it's the epistemic burden on the people who already have plenty of other burdens to figure this stuff out and resist um, these stereotypes. And no, I think that the epistemic mistake is entirely at the level of the people who are um, creating these stereotypes and creating these norms. And like they're the ones who are epistemically blameworthy. Um, I think that's what I want to say about this kind of thing. Absolutely. So, I mean, I think, um, how do you know? Well, I mean, the kinds of, uh, you, you look at the kinds of things that the disability rights movement has, in fact, done. So they've wanted to create awareness uh, about issues of um, accessibility and stigma and prejudice for people who have physical, um, so in the case of physical disabilities, for people who have uh, physical conditions who in some sense, make an impact on their day-to-day -day life, right? Um, are going to affect the way they navigate the world. So um, then that's obviously vague. Um, what kind of conditions uh, make a, you know, make, make a significant uh, in, impact on your day-to-day -day life? So I certainly uh, don't consider myself disabled because I wear these, um, because the, although it does impact my daily life in that I have to put them on um, or put my contacts on, otherwise I can't see very well. It's not significant, and I face no social stigma from it. In fact, if anything, if you're an academic and you wear glasses, that's like a good thing. Um, especially if you're a woman, because it's like, <laughs> it's maybe like plus one to your, to your smartness uh, uh, score. Um, smartness is bad. Um, so, the idea would be, uh, you know, okay, well then, how, uh, what kind of things count as, as, as having a substantial impact on your daily life? And then, you know, I'm kind of, I think it probably doesn't matter that much. You know, if, I think at that point, self-identity isn't, like, should, should, should play a role. And, you know, if, if you feel strongly that this is something that has a substantial impact, on your daily life, and you face stigma because of it, and you know you have um, reasons to uh, you know to, to need various uh, issues of awareness and 
call it a disability because, I mean, one thing that I think would be really good for our conception of disability is if we understood it as, as more pervasive and more common. Um, I think the only, re the only practical reason for not self-identifying as disabled is if you, you sometimes get people saying things like, oh, well, really, when you think about it, everyone is disabled. No, they're not. Um, and that's a dumb thing to say, don't say that. Um, uh, I think it's, if you try to make it too pervasive, you lose out on the fact that, no, there is a substantial group of the population who is stigmatized because of what their bodies are like and who go through a lot because of their, what their bodies are like. Um, and if you try to make it too much of a just, oh, really, when you think about it, um, you know, everybody's disabled and, you know, probably in virtue of being nearsighted, I'm disabled, and, um, then you, you lose that element of, um, of, of stigma and of something that, um, you know, impacts importantly um, on your day-to-day -day life. So, like, um, just to, as a random example, you know, I don't identify as queer even though I dated women in college because I've been married to a man for 10 years. Like, I get all the heteronormative privilege that's out there in the world, I get it, right? Um, so there's no sense in which me trying to, like, go, oh, yeah, no, I, I, face, I face the stigma of being queer. No, no, of course I don't. Um, uh, so I, I think that would be the only reason to, um, to consider whether one ought to, to self-identify as Yeah, I mean, that, that's going to depend a lot um, on, you know, on just what it looks, you know, just how much progress has been made. Because I was trying to think through examples um, of when I would think somebody kind of isn't blameworthy. So I was trying to think, okay, well, what I think, you know, do I think um, that women who, in, you know, have some, have a difficulty understanding uh, the idea of strong, independent women or something? that or, you know, women who are capable. But, you know, in a lot of cases, no, I don't blame them. Um, because, you know, sexism and misogyny is still a big thing. It's maybe gone underground. Um, but, but it's still, and, you know, maybe, maybe it's less understandable than it was 200 years ago. Um, but it's still understandable. Um, and, and not everyone is same. So again, I still, in that case, want to say it's not obviously the epistemic mistake of the woman. It's the epistemic mistake of, um, the, of, of, of social norms. So I mean, in a, in a case where, I'm trying to, like, imagine a gender utopia where there was genuinely no sexism. Um, and no gender inequality, but then there was just somebody who had a hard time understanding the idea of a strong woman um, or a capable woman or you know, something like that. Then I think that that person is super blameworthy, right? That um, that that person is is making um, an epistemic mistake. You know, they think that just because women, on average, have less upper body strength, um, uh, or you know, just because they're more likely to suffer from a um, there are people who are female are more likely to suffer from anemia. Therefore, um, women women aren't as capable or something like that. You're so okay at that point. Yeah, you're blameworthy. That's, so if we could get to that place with disability, then I would say yeah, the individual is, is blameworthy. Um, but I can't. That, that's that's a long way to go. Um, if if that makes sense. Um, you might think. I mean, so Fricker is a virtue epistemologist. So I think for her, you know, she is interested in this idea of um, epistemic blame and epistemic. Yeah. But but that I think for her, a lot of this is going to come in degrees. Um, and I think that um, you know, a hundred. So today, uh, you know, a woman who just totally buys all the norms of sexism, even though a lot of other information is available to her, you might think, okay, there's a sense in which you're maybe somewhat blameworthy for that even though sexism is a lot more blameworthy. Um, you're still, you, there is other information available to you, and um, you're in some sense not responding to some of the evidence available. But you're not as blameworthy as the person who lives in a gender utopia and things like that. Um, maybe I'd want to say the same thing about, about disability. So 100 years from now, uh, we live in a 
wonderful, accessible uh, society, um, and somebody still is just having a hard time understanding this kind of idea, then, you know, um, maybe they're partially blameworthy. I don't, I don't think it's something that had to be an on-off um, notion of, of epidemic. So I think um, it is the social, it's primarily the social, nor uh, the, the, the sort of the, the stereotypes and the norms and the, that we say, okay, that's where, that's the location of the epistemic mistake. Because for Fricker, she thinks, because these phenomena are um, systematic um, and because they are social, sometimes we can't, there, there's no one person that we can point to um, and say, okay, this is, this is the source. This is, and collectively, um, we might not even say, okay, all the men, uh, all the men are responsible for the sexism. That doesn't seem right either. Um, maybe it's, you know, just as easy for um, men to be influenced by dominant uh, social structures as it is, or dominant social stereotypes and schemas as it is for women. Or um, So the problem for her is a twofold thing. So it's that we have these stereotypes that are false. And then our way of producing knowledge is um, we produce knowledge in a way that's power imbalanced. Right? So it's easier for men to contribute to the common ground than it is for women to contribute to the common ground. Um, it's easier for uh, straight people to contribute to the common ground than it is for gay people to contribute to the common ground. So even if no individual man or no individual straight person is individually responsible for the creation of this stereotype, the situation in which knowledge is being produced, because it's hierarchical, because it, it, it has power imbalances, is itself unjust. So certainly for Fricker, she doesn't want to place the blame in these systematic cases on individual knowers. She wants to place the, locate the injustice on the situations in which knowledge is being Right. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So I think I think it's really important to distinguish between uh, cases where people feel like their own experiences aren't being accommodated uh, within a movement, or people feel like their own experiences aren't being given voice to, or um, aren't being represented, and cases in which people genuinely feel like they they can't articulate, um, they they don't understand their own. And the kind of case you were describing, it certainly happens a lot um, in social movements. And certainly if you look back at the history of the, the LGBT uh, movement and why we now call it the LGBT movement, um, and wait, no, it's LGBT star now, um, is for exactly this reason that people were saying, hey, well, what about, you know, it's not just gay pride, it's gay and lesbian pride. And it's like, it's not just gay pride, it's gay and lesbian and bi. And it's, no, it's gay and lesbian, bi and trans. And then, but there's lots of sort of, there's a whole spectrum and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that was people sort of coming to uh, a social movement and saying, allow me to describe my experience to you. Um, look how this, the way that you're representing this movement as covering all of us doesn't really adequately represent me. Um, but for one thing, that kind of happened, I, I think it would have been harder for that to happen. Um, for us to talk about all the different and varied ways that people can um, experience sexuality. If you hadn't started with people saying, hey, it's okay to talk about these other alternative, you know, these, these other sexualities that have been described as deviant. Um, no, we're not gonna accept that deviant label. We're gonna, um, you know, we're gonna have pride. We're going to, um, we're gonna celebrate these and, tr and treat them as part of a social movement rather than as something you, you see your doctor about. Um, so likewise in the disability case, obviously there's a ton that needs to be ironed out, um, but not representing someone's experience is a different thing than a case where people literally just find it hard to um, understand or articulate their own experience. And I guess it's not clear to me that just by having a movement that looks like at the moment, which I'm sure it certainly is because it's, you know, the disability rights movement is young, um, is too coarse-grained and doesn't represent 
enough variation and doesn't all of that. Um, that doesn't, at least on the face of it, look automatically like it's going to lead to a phenomenon like hermeneutical injustice rather than just the kind of phenomenon like you know, we saw in the, in the gay rights movement, which was um, increasingly people coming forward and saying, this needs to be more nuanced, this needs to have more representation, this needs to accommodate more types of people than, um, than you're currently allowing. And certainly, I mean, this has already happened in the disability rights movement where, you know, for a long time it was just, the, the far and away the most prominent was uh, people with very particular kinds of mobility limitations and then people with sensory modality loss. And like all of the stuff that they would talk about would just, just accessibility issues for those very particular things. Um, and people in the disability community complained that it created kind of a hierarchy um, amongst disabled people. There's like the very visible disabilities that people are familiar with that are maybe more common and those are the things that, you know, it was easier to fight for accessibility for, and then the less widely known ones, or the less visible ones, or the less, and it almost started replicating the same structure of, okay, um, get accessibility for the common stuff and not accessibility for the less common stuff. So that's definitely the kind of thing that that already has been going on and needs to be ironed out um, and will continue to be struggled along with in the, in the disability rights movement. Um, it's not clear to me that that's terminatable. Right. So I, I think that's absolutely right. And I actually think uh, what pride movements are doing uh, is trying to replace these, uh, these sort of normatively laden distinctions with a more value-free one, but it's just what they have to do to do that um, is to go into this language of pride and celebration. So there's a view of disability which I call the Magneto view of disability, which is that, in fact, um, the Disabilities are the, the best things, and uh, really non-disabled people are the ones with the inferior bodies, and disabled people should just separate out and, uh, uh, you know, form a collective of freaks who will all be better. Um, so that's, I think, clearly not the view of um, disability that the disability pride movement wants to endorse. I think, I think when they're talking about pride, the idea is that you're licensing pride rather than demanding it. Because we take pride in all sorts of things that we think it's kind of a quirk of personality that you can take pride in it. So it's like, you know, you can be proud of things that you think ultimately are value free. So you might be, um, you know, proud of the fact that um, your ancestry hails from Scotland, uh, even though you think it's not like people from Scotland are better than people from um, or something. It's just like this is something that that you're that you're you just feel an emotive attachment to, or you might be uh, proud of your ability to like when you're in college do a keg stand, even though you know that like there's actually nothing normatively important about being able to do a keg. It's just something you're proud of. Um, you will show it off at any opportunity. Um, so pride is more of a of a licensing. <laughs> it's like a license to celebrate rather than to say. You don't have, this isn't something you hide, this isn't something you feel sorry for, you, this isn't, you know, but it doesn't obviously shift the valence in the other direction. Certainly, in the early stages of the gay pride movement, I think there, are people who, there were people who did want to shift, especially amongst the, uh, for lesbian pride, because there was the idea that like, lesbianism was the, was the end product of feminism, right? It was like, if you were, if you were the true women's liberation feminist, then then you know, lesbianism was really where it was at, right? Um, and it was somehow in, importantly morally better. But I think I think that was more more or less a minority view. And I think a lot of a lot of times pride is more just about um, this being something that it's okay to celebrate, that it makes sense to celebrate. It's not oxymoronic to celebrate. You're not doing the villain support group thing, rather than saying it's mandated that you celebrate this. Thank you.